Like I get on calls with like say smaller agencies or brands that are just starting out and they just sort of don't know where to start. For those people, I'd just say, yeah, just start with like your simple three pillars. Just be like benefit one, benefit two, benefit three, create five different variations of those ads and then just start testing them from there. Today, I sit down with Lackey Thompson, who specializes in Facebook ads. And today we're gonna be specifically breaking down on how he was able to scale one of his clients from 40K to 320K per month, multiple months, mind you. I'm Nikita from aspectagency.com, and let's get into the podcast. Lucky, pleasure to have you on the Scaling E-Commerce Podcast. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate you for coming on. I know last week we did one on your podcast. So if you haven't checked out that one, we are going to be talking about all things SMS related. But today I wanted to have you on and discuss the current state of affairs on the Facebook and I guess meta ads uh, state of affairs, basically. So one thing I just wanted to jump right out the gate with is obviously there's a lot of Facebook ads agencies out there. Um, and I wanted to ask you specifically, like, what makes you guys different than every other agency that's out there? Yeah. So obviously there's a lot of competition within the agency space and it's grown a lot over the last four years that I've been doing it. Like there wasn't much competition four years ago, but then it seems like every kid in their bedroom is running a agency of some sort at the moment. So right. we've got that experience to back us up now. And we've had experience taking brands from 10K months to 100K months. We've taken brands from 40K months to 320K months. Uh, but what's allowed us to do that is our close relationship with our clients and communication that's next level. Uh, so we recently also, we've been uh, like pretty much simplifying our ad accounts. So then mm -hmm. we can focus on other things like CRO or email or all that other stuff and consulting alongside the brand, like with the brand founder to work on other things in the business that will produce better results in the Facebook ad accounts as well. So we're not just going in there and trying to hack our way through the ad account. Uh, we're actually providing valuable information to brand founders, not just on Facebook ads, but the whole system. So a lot of agencies are tied up in like the media buying aspect of it. It's like, we got to be a good media buyer. And it, from what I've seen is after iOS hit, you don't really need to be a good media buyer because obviously it's very hard to control data already. Accounts have gotten way more simplified. You just have to have a good creative at this point. And it, it, it took iOS for people to understand that it's about the creative rather than the targeting because you're, you've already lost the targeting. You know, it's time to actually call people out with a creative. How do you handle that creative process? Because I know you're simplifying accounts. Does that simplification add in more time on your end to spend more time on the creative side? Yeah, for sure. So when I first started four years ago, it was about running 10 ad sets with 10 different interests or 10 different lookalikes. And right. that used to work back then. And it was a lot more manual work within the ad account. But now uh, with the Advantage Plus campaigns, especially, it's a lot more hands off within the ad account. So now, yeah, we've got like my team looks like just graphic designers at the moment and video editors trying to produce content on a daily basis for the client. So, yeah, we're spending a lot more time on that. In the past, like I used to just grab whatever the client had on Instagram and just hack my way through the ad account pretty much. But then we've changed that process now to sp spending most of our time on creative. That's good. It's funny how things have flipped because I used to be the same way when I used to run Facebook ads for clients. It was all interest based targeting and having like crazy amounts of ad sets. And now it's just way simpler and you just have crazy amounts of graphic designers. So same problem, just different solution essentially. And before we even started recording, you told me about a brand that you took from 40K a month all the way up to having 320K months. That's plural. That's multiple months at 320k can you break down how you were able to achieve that yeah so for them a lot of their growth um isn't attributed to me like they had a first to market product as well but right with that um like it was a very unique product uh, that had good unique selling points so once i got that product in front of people's eyes through facebook then people were like just buying it and snapping it up. It was such like a really good price point for what it was and it saved a massive headache for parents. Uh, so those guys, yeah, absolutely crushed it. And the one of the main things that worked through the ad account was just 
uh, going from like Australia, but then they also moved into the US, uh, Canada, the United Kingdom as well. So their logistics scaled as well, which allowed me to get more eyeballs on the products and they were happy to spend as well, sort of at that break even mark, which allowed us to rapidly scale. Whereas some brands are like, no, we need to hit that six to eight roll as on 5k spend and that's all we're willing to spend. And as soon as they scale and see that rollers drop, they start to panic. So those guys really knew their numbers as well on their end and they'll actually invested in growing whereas some brands they sort of get uh a bit complacent or comfortable and they don't want that like massive scale does do you sort of get that with your clients as well they get to a certain point and they're like they're comfortable yeah i've had that before where i've you know just on the email side you can still see everything with like like even on Clayview, you can see the shopify numbers on like how much revenue they brought on brought on for the last like, seven days or 30 days so I've noticed like a lot of times when we were working on our client accounts, it's like, you know, you see like 80K a month, 70K a month, 85K a month, 90K a month. You know, we're obviously bringing in our side of the email, but like we see like the consistency of just, you know, or the complacency of the revenue. And I'm like, guys, what's going on here? Like for the last four months, you guys have been hovering plus or minus 10K. What What's going on? Is the agency dropping the ball? Because we're clearly not. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, we actually need a new agency. Can you intro us? And that starts a new conversation. And that's where we start to like, it, it could be either the agency that they're working with just wasn't the right fit for them. Or, you know, they got them from, you know, 30K to 80K, but they weren't able to go past that 80K. So that's where another conversation has to be had. Um, and you brought up a good point in your um, in your response there with, expanding out to different markets is that something that you usually do or do you mainly work with australian brands yeah so we mainly work with australian brands we work with uh our next major market is in the us and then right. canada and then the uk the uk is pretty shit time zone for <laughs> australia uh so we don't typically like to work with them but uh yeah mainly australian brands right. and we're taking them internationally but like before you get to that level you sort of need to dominate your own market and then move out there's no point getting all those extra overheads going into the us because the grass is greener on the other side if the product isn't already working in australia yeah and walk me through that because i'm i've always been interested i've never had a chance to expand into international markets with any of my clients it was either like it was either in the us the uk or canada it was never you know, US, UK and Canada, uh, like how does that even work in not only the ad account, but also company wide, what kind of messaging do you have to tinker with that sort of thing? So within the ad account, so there's a couple of different strategies you can use. You can either split them out by country. So you can see the exact numbers broken down on the, just the, uh, forward fronting dashboard. Uh, so easy to see numbers, or you can put them all into like one ad set. Uh, go like super broad and allow Facebook to sort of distribute that budget how Facebook deems. Now, it will usually go to that market that's got a larger audience. Uh, so you got to be careful of that and make sure that's profitable for you. And you can see that via the breakdowns. Uh, but on like the messaging sort of thing, Australia, the US, UK, they're sort of similar people. Like they, they're always consuming sort of similar content. Uh, so we did use some specific messaging. Hey, we're now shipping to the US, that sort of thing. But what resonated more is just the benefit that the mm -hmm. end user is going to receive. And that resonated with them more. Like if you're showing ads to a certain country, they sort of expect that shipping's going to be fast anyway, especially with how Amazon is. Like products come in like one or two days. So yeah, they sort of just expect that. It, it like might be a logistical nightmare for that brand to actually achieve that, but that's what people expect these days. Yeah, and I think it also comes in with, you know, it ties in very well with having a, just a good logistics partner. You know, I know there's a guy, I think his, his company is like Magnitude Group. I don't know if you're familiar with them. He's also like, I think he's New Zealand-based, not Australian-based, close to you, um, depending on which side of Australia you're on. But um, he has, he's partnered up with a 3PL uh, and he helps clients scale through like specific markets because he's also closely tied with a 3PL that he can just yeah. immediately scale them up or at least test the new markets immediately all over the world. So in your specific case, when you were scaling this specific brand, uh, what kind of messaging, I know we talked about not much messaging had to be changed, but obviously the creatives had to be changed. 
you know, let's say you had like a really good UGC creative that was working with the Australian market. Did you have to like basically reshoot or recreate those kinds of ads on the UK and the US market? Because obviously it's thrown off with the accent and all. <laughs> yeah, so we did try to get uh, like creators for each specific market. Uh, like obviously, like some people might not be able to understand my accent because I talk pretty fast and I get that a fair bit. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, like, the creative that absolutely crushed it was just an American one, mm. like an American UGC. And we ran that in Australia because we're so used to watching American content anyway. Like if we see a movie with an Australian in it, like they sound weird. That's like <laughs> they even sound weird for us. Uh, so yeah, that um, American video was the best performing and it's sort of like the most watched content, I guess, because the population so big. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I'd say the American market is always the best market to advertise in, but also the most competitive market. So if you can knock it out of the park here, you can easily replicate those same exact ads across the pond, uh, whichever pond you go, whether Pacific or yeah. Atlantic Ocean. And did you do you tend to notice that as well, working with I guess US based accounts? Yeah. So if we had a creative that was performing in any of those three markets, even Canada as well. Like mm. they usually perform pretty well because what we're talking about in those ads is the benefit the end user is going to receive at the end of the day. So those ads were easily replicated across those countries. And right. a lot of the ads that we were running was Advantage Plus campaigns with those countries just stacked in together. And then Facebook was distributing a budget to where it felt like it was best being served. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem that we did run into was obviously that brand was expanding into new markets and they had overheads in each of those markets. Uh, so we did need a certain percentage of budget going to each of those markets to facilitate the overheads that they now had through logistics. Yeah, of course. And when it comes down to just running ads on a daily basis for your clients, are there any specific like things that you're starting to notice going into Q3 or Q, like end of Q2 uh, going into Q3 that are maybe like either specific quirks or the way that specific ad budgets need to be placed. Like what is the current state of affairs with Facebook ads right now or just meta ads in general? Yeah, so I'm heavily leaning into Advantage Plus campaigns. So that's more like the AI algorithm driven campaigns, easy to set up by Facebook and pretty much anyone can do that. And it's like so simple, so easy to set up, but that's what's performing the best at the moment for us anyway. And then image content, ever since sort of around that Black Friday period mm -hmm. last year, we've just seen image absolutely crush it. So over that Black Friday period, we'd have like an image, we'd have a GIF and a video in a, under an ad set. And mostly the images were getting the spend and the highest returns. And we're like, oh, we're going to double down on this because that's working. And it's also easier to produce image content as well. So you can create so many more variations really quickly with image content and yeah we've pretty much been doubling down on that as well right so that advantage plus campaign i'm not too familiar with facebook ads it's been a minute since i've been an, yeah. an ad account is that sort of like the performance max type campaign on google ads if you're familiar with that where you yeah, just throw yeah. in a bunch of creatives a bunch of assets a bunch of copy and it optimizes around the best i guess performing one off of the pixel data or you know triple whale data or whatever you use yeah so yeah it's pretty much it's sort of like a less hands-on approach and it's sort of just giving, like you give the algorithm or the AI the, the inputs. So you might have a creative that's talking about uh, a certain benefit and then you put those creatives in, it'll start to optimize around that based on the user feedback. Nice, nice. Now walk me through how you specifically work with clients. I know you said that you're trying to lean less on just doing the media buying itself and more on the creative, the strategy, the CRO. How do you yeah. typically work with a client? Do you just, do you audit them and, you know, give them like, okay, we need to do this, this, and this, or do you just start off with ads, get the ball rolling and then start to work on other services? Yeah. So when we first start working with the client, they're obviously pumped up to start working with us. And then we try to get ads out as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. That first round of ads, we usually just go to their best performing Instagram post, put that in the ad account, put some actual spend behind it. We usually find that works pretty well. And for brands that like haven't really had a strategy or maybe they've never run ads in the past um, and they've got, say, 20,000 sessions per month, we can come in, instantly retarget those people and start converting pretty much from day one. 
Uh, but with those other clients that have been sort of running ads, maybe they're unhappy with the agency. That's when mm -hmm. we'll do those in-depth audits on their ad account, but also their website to find quick little wins there. Because if we can improve their conversion rate, that's only going to help us produce better results on Facebook ads as well. Right. Yeah. Because everything, like when we used to run everything, uh, we did do that exact same thing. We we first analyze, well, first you have to get the ads out rolling because that's just time, like wait time and money being wasted. So you need to get something out there. And then in the meantime, we're working on optimizing the creatives, optimizing the ad copy back when you actually had to do that um, yeah. before Advantage Plus. And in the meantime, we were setting up a landing page to start testing out the CRO side and making sure that everything is like a cohesive unit while also doing emails. You can see this is kind of like a headache. So how do you manage to juggle all of that when also running the ads for the client. Yeah, so we focus a lot on the ads. So that's our primary role. And then we do CRO consulting. We don't actually implement that. Mm. The brand will usually have an agency that they're already familiar with, or we have uh, like partner agencies that we refer work out to. Right. They do need something done. Yeah, that makes it so much easier. Uh, it seems like a lot more people are, or a lot more agencies at least, are trying to niche down into their own specialties, you know, myself included, because it's a lot like while well, you have the big, you know, agencies out there that are hundred plus people teams, they have everything under the sun. But I find a lot more comfort being in a specific niche when it comes to working with a client. Yeah, for sure. And if you can produce results like we do, like you just become so much more confident. You're like, bang, 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 here's what we need to do. Clients like, oh, cool, this guy knows what he's doing. This is moving really fast. They know exactly what they're going to do. And yeah, just laying out that roadmap for them as well. Is like, here's what we're doing now. Here's what we're going to do in the future. And then, yeah, let's keep the ball rolling. Right. Now, this is something, I don't know if you're open to sharing this, but is there anything special that you're testing right now with your clients on the, whether it's the ad side, the CRO side? whatever performance marketing channel it is, like what is something that's that you're testing right now that might have some promise? Uh, I wouldn't say we're testing anything different. Like obviously I'm on like Twitter all day and I always see like people just flooding it with like different strategies and that yeah, sort of thing. Sticky note ads. <laughs> yeah, those things or yeah, the notes on your iPhone ads and that sort of thing. So no, no not really. We're just doubling down on yeah, the creative testing, like benefit, what benefits are the users going to receive at the end of the day and just doing the simple things well all the time and just putting more spend behind stuff that's actually working. Like I get on calls with like say smaller agencies or brands that are just starting out and they just sort of don't know where to start. For those people, I'd just say, yeah, just start with like your simple three pillars. Just be like benefit one, benefit two, benefit three. Create five different variations of those ads and then just start testing them from there. Like once every week, flip in a new creative test and yeah, sort of go from there and like you fail forward pretty much. Like if a creative doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. Uh, you, you've got another four there you can test out under that pillar. When it comes to new brands, obviously spending money is what actually gives you the results, but also at the same time, it teaches you. It's a very hard teacher. So yeah. when it comes down to it, is there any specific like testing budget that you utilize or any specific testing percentage that you find to work out the best for your clients? So that way you're not obviously burning too much money if there is a failed test, but at the same time, you know how to determine a winner when it's spent you know, a certain amount of money there. So if there's account history, then we look at the average CPA. So your average cost per acquisition or cost per purchase. So we look at that. If it's around like say $40, we might spend 80 to $120 on that test. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't receive any purchases during that time, then we're looking to flip in a new creative. And then, yeah, we'll sort of go from there. If it gets a couple of purchases, we'll let that run out $150, $200. And yeah, it would sort of go from there. But if it doesn't generate a purchase within, say, two to three times the average cost per purchase, uh, right. then we're looking at changing things up. Got it. Yeah, that seems to be the main like way that we used to test is just like either 2x or 3x the CPA. Um, yeah. If the CPA is way too high, then like if it's a product that's like a $200 product and their CPA was like $100, like you can't spend 300 bucks on an ad. Yeah. yeah. So there we have to cut it like a little bit shorter and... Do you, is that what you find as well, like still working with like high AOV products? Yeah. So obviously with the higher AOV products, you do need a little bit more time. Uh, but with like a CPA, uh, AOV of like 
180 to like 300 we're still seeing purchases between yeah that 35 dollar mark to 70 dollar mark uh so as soon as we're getting to like pushing 150 no purchases coming in the click-through rates and stuff are looking bad then yeah we're cutting that and if they're extremely bad like a 0.4 percent click-through rate or something like that we're like no the something needs to change pretty quickly or if you get like a really shit creative and it's like got a $40 CPM or something for e-commerce like that's pretty poor Facebook's sort of telling you to shut that off or they're just gonna charge it through the roof yeah exactly you still have those leading indicators of the the click-through rate cost per click etc to help you out yeah great now I wanted to close this off with just one last I guess like golden nugget or at least three golden nuggets is you know in the current day day and age of meta ads like what would be like the three highest leverage actions that a brand could take uh to help i guess improve their facebook ad results yeah so number one would be lean into advantage plus at the moment creative testing and images you don't need to focus on like that higher production ugc that costs you thousands of dollars each and every month just go to canva templates go to your facebook ads library look at your competitors that sort of thing leverage sort of what's working for them and then number three just staying consistent with it and actually knowing your metrics as well i get on so many calls with brand owners that don't even know how to open up the dashboard and look at their numbers so they might get a bad agency that are like hey we're generating so many like impressions click-through rates like like uh your landing page use like we're sending lots of sessions to the website and the brand at the end of the day is like hey, my agency says we're doing really well, but we're not growing. I'm like, that's because they're not generating any conversions. <laughs> so yeah, just making sure you actually know the numbers as well. And yeah, just focusing on those three things. So add plus your image testing and then uh, knowing your numbers. I think that last point is probably the most important out of all of them because that transcends not only just ads, but everything else that you talked about. You know, if a brand doesn't know their specific call uh, or cost per acquisition, they don't know how much they have to pay for shipping, their 3PL cost, logistics cost, whatever all those costs are, they don't know if they're going to be able to scale or, you know, they might have an extra, you know, $3 of leeway in their CPA that they could give you where you can yeah. bring in more customers. So I think knowing the numbers is by far the most important thing that any brand should know. Yeah. Even just as simple as knowing your break even, Roaz, like how much can you spend to acquire a customer? And that's like such a big word for a brand founder. It's like, what does that even mean? Or how do I even work that out? Like the simple calculators you can Google and plug in your numbers. Uh, but yeah, most people don't do it. It's like, what do these abbreviations mean? It's like, bro, <laughs> just, it's your responsibility as a brand owner to know this stuff. You know, otherwise you're losing money and you don't even know it the brands that we work with that like get the best results know their numbers uh so they're also having input into the campaigns be like hey maybe we could test this or maybe like they come to us with ideas as well and because they know their product better than we do uh they also come up with unique things and they might be a little bit more risky as well like we can put some risky ideas to the client hey maybe we can test this uh provoke some action or engagement on these ads uh, some brands don't like doing that. Some brands are like, yeah, do whatever, like get eyes on the product. Uh, but yeah, as soon as we get that input from the client, that's where you get brand scaling from say 40 K months to 320 K months, because they know what they can spend to acquire that customer. And they're happy to run say at a break even, and then like take into account lifetime value and that sort of thing as well. Absolutely. Well, Lucky, it was a pleasure having you on. Where would be the best place for people to find you? Instagram's definitely the best place to find me. That's where I'm the most active. So yeah, if you've got any questions um, or just want to check out some clips and some valuable content, go to Lucky underscore social slingshot. Absolutely. Well, it was a pleasure to have you on and I uh, look forward to the next one. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Thanks again for joining us on the Scaling E-Commerce podcast. If you enjoyed it or learned something new, Remember to like, subscribe, and leave a review. It really helps out with the algorithm. If you want email marketing tips delivered straight to your inbox on a weekly basis from yours truly, then check out the link below or in the show notes to subscribe and join my newsletter. If you're a D2C brand with at least 10,000 email subscribers and interested in starting a conversation to work together, then go to aspectagency.com and we'd love to chat with you. And if you want to stay up to date with anything email and SMS, just follow me on Twitter 
at Nikita Vakrushev or check the show notes for the link. With that said, I'm Nikita and I'll see you in the next one.